right now on Close Up with The Hollywood Reporter. Quentin is a filmmaker who doesn't hold back. He takes the bullets and goes out on the front line. But there has been criticism, especially from the African-American community. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that criticism? See, they seated no. us next to each other. <laughs> 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 We're going to hear from the producers of the most admired films. Ice Cube, Straight Outta Compton. Steve Golan, The Revenant and Spotlight. Stacey Sher, The Hateful Eight. Scott Cooper, Black Mass. Christine Vachon, Carol. Simon Kinberg, The Martian. Welcome to Close Up with The Hollywood Reporter. I'm Stephen Galloway, Executive Editor of Features. And I'm Matthew Bellany, Executive Editor. Let's get started. Looking back, several of you have had careers now for some time. What advice would you give to your younger selves? Let's start with <laughs> oh, Stacy. Goodness. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, to not be so timid. I know that that doesn't really seem to resonate with my personality, but I think that one of the things, particularly being a woman doing what you do, you tend to defer a lot and deflect, like, don't worry about me, I'm just over here working, doing my job. I always found ways to push the films that, that I worked on, but I think I worried a little bit too much about how you're perceived as being a good girl or a, a good worker, and I think I would tell my younger self not to worry about that too much. Do you think that's, that being a woman made you feel that more? Definitely being a, a woman at the time that I came up in the business. Ironically, a lot of the women that worked in Hollywood at that time really kind of practiced what Gloria Steinem would have called the kind of queen bee syndrome, and there was only a limited number of people at the table and they weren't really helpful necessarily. I think it's really changed a lot now. I think that we all try to kind of lift everybody up and it's not as scary. Do you agree with that, Christy? Uh, yeah, I mean, my advice to my younger self would probably be buy real estate. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that ship has sailed. So, Particularly uh, in New York. <laughs> right. But I, I, do, I do agree with that. I mean, I think most women of our generation probably experienced a lot of like, you know, I don't want people, I don't, you know, I don't want to be the bitch. Mm. And after a while, you just kind of, you know, you just learn that, that it's not a popularity contest. Nope. And don't get me wrong, I think men learn that too, but I think there's a different kind of, uh, it, it's a little different for women because it's a little bit more stigmatized. Well, I think it's because we're labeled in that way. If you are a strong man, right. you're a strong man. If you're a strong woman, you're a bitch. Cube, did you have a problem with timidity? <laughs> <laughs> nah, uh, I think my advice would be to not take the process so personal, you know, as, you know, being a black filmmaker, you think, oh man, is why is this not getting made? And why is this piece of shit getting made over here? And then and, and and not this movie that I think is great. And then you realize after you've been in the business so long that every movie is hard to get made. You know, every movie on every level. You know, it's probably Steven Spielberg is probably saying, damn, is it because I'm Steven Spielberg they don't want to make this movie? You know, so I just realized that movies are hard to get made. When you finish a movie, you go back to the bottom, trying to convince somebody this is the next one that they should invest in. And that's fine, you know, that process is fine. I've learned to accept the process and not be so worried and paranoid about the process. Was Straight Outta Compton harder or easier than most pictures? Harder. It was the hardest movie, and I've been producing movies since 1995, you know, Friday, which I did with Gary Gray, which his first, movie he directed, the first movie I produced. It was, you know, kind of building up to this moment. We was honing our skills to this moment, but this was the hardest movie ever. <laughs> you know, not just because of so many dynamic personalities, so many different stories, so many different legal problems, uh, outside threats. We kept telling ourselves that no good movie is easy to make, you know, so, you know, that kind of kept us going. It's like, it wasn't easy to make The Godfather. It wasn't easy to make these great movies that we love, so we need to endure this pain and, and make sure that we have a great movie. What was the most painful moment? Seeing it about to fall apart <laughs> at many different times, you know, the movie, you know, that was like our biggest thing was using all of our powers to keep it together because it just wanted to unravel in so many different areas. Because nobody wanted to compromise our 
love, <laughs> you know, for the film. And everybody felt passionate. And, you know, it was a few different times where everybody was saying, it's better to walk away than to make something we're not proud of, man. So those was the hardest times. You had some problems with Suge Knight. Mm -hmm. How did they affect you in the filming? We didn't make the records when it comes to NWA and producing those records without controversy, without danger. <laughs> so this movie's not gonna be made without controversy and danger. It's not supposed to be. You know, that's kind of how we felt. We knew that a lot of people didn't want the movie to be made, and that was fine, but it was our job to tell the best story we could tell. What you see when you go outside your door? I know what I see. And it ain't glamorous. You get AKs from Russia and cocaine from Colombia. And ain't none of us got a passport, so... Yeah. <laughs> Might want to check the source. Yeah, next question. Will you be more careful about what you say, how you say it? No. No. Probably not, no. Why? Freedom of speech includes rap music, right? But we exercise in our First Amendment, as far as I'm concerned. And the government wrote that. Steve, you have two films this year, The Spotlight and The Revenant. And The Revenant seems to have been a much more challenging shoot. Leonardo DiCaprio has said that he's been sleeping in animal carcasses and almost had hypothermia and such. Tell us a little bit about the challenge of making that film, especially in the context of all the other films you've made. Well, the two films are so completely different. They were both incredibly difficult to get made. But The Revenant was the most difficult production in terms of the logistics. You know, Alejandro's extremely demanding, choosing locations, completely unrelenting demand for perfection in what he wants. So it was a very, very difficult shoot, and Leo w w was really great. What Cube said is really right, is that, you know, it's so difficult to get these movies made, and, you know, the younger self-question is just develop a thick skin early because it's gonna be a rough ride all the way along. And, um, and he's also right about the fact you get a movie made and it's a good movie and then you're at the bottom of the pile again. You're still Willie Loman trying to sell your wares to everybody out there and it's a big mountain to climb. But The Revenant was the most difficult production in terms of the logistics. It was a very, very difficult shoot and Leo w w was really great. He didn't actually sleep in any animal carcasses. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a scene in the movie where he sleeps in an animal carcass, but it wasn't a real animal carcass and he didn't sleep in it. He was in it for about two hours. <laughs> so that's a little exaggeration, but um, it was a very difficult shoot. I mean, we were shooting in Calgary, the, the conditions were freezing. It was a real interesting thing in the sense of trying, you know, in a way reliving what those actual people lived only we had, you know, the right clothes and warming tents and people going out of their way to keep us without hypothermia. But, I mean, it was really uh, a tremendous experience. The, this film started out with a 60 million budget and the rumors around town that it, uh, that it reached 200 million. Oh, no, that's ridiculous. But it did escalate. You know, it wasn't like it got greenlit at 60 million. There was talk early on of doing it at that price, but that was a joke. And the movie uh, was greenlit at substantially more than that and expanded beyond that. It wasn't that it was out of control, it's just Alejandro made the movie bigger and bigger and they, they went along with it. What happened? We did what we had to do. He was very right. My dad was my boy and he took him from me, you understand? He's afraid. Would you, going back to your younger self, have been able to make this picture when you started? I barely made it now. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, this was the biggest picture that I've been involved in and certainly the most logistically complicated. Simon, you started as a writer mm -hmm. and then moved into being a producer as well. What advice would you give your younger self? I would probably give my younger self the advice to uh, make movies you love because it's miserable. I mean, as these guys said, every movie I've worked on at one point or another and, and at most points in the process is exhausting and you feel like you're making a bad movie and it's hard to convince people to give you the money and the time or the effort that you need. When I started out, I, I came out of film school. I went after movies that I thought were the movies that audiences wanted to see or that the movies that the, mm. that the studios wanted as opposed to the movies that I wanted to see. And I think over the last 10 years, and I've been doing this for 15 or more, I've gravitated more and more toward the films that I grew up loving. 
and trying to make movies like those. So I think that's the advice I would give so myself. what were those films? Well, I grew up in, in, uh, on the movies of the 80s, so it was classic Spielberg, Lucas, James Cameron, Ridley Scott movies. Uh, it was mostly genre films. Star Wars was a big seminal movie in my life. Um, the Terminator movies, Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, Beverly Hills Cop. Like, I loved studio movies when I was a kid growing up, and I really liked high-quality ones. So to sort of come full circle on that for me and work with Ridley Scott on a science fiction movie was this kind of incredible dream come true. And also to work on the Star Wars films. Yeah. What surprised you with each one, with Ridley and with the Star Wars universe? What surprised me about Ridley was just, he, he's the hardest working filmmaker I've ever met. And he's made a lot of movies and he's 78 years old and he has more energy and more focus and is more demanding of everyone around him in a good way than any filmmaker I've ever seen who's, you know, a third of his age. He had really the whole movie in his head and I felt like we were translating what was in his head onto screen as opposed to discovering or even creating it. I mean, it was literally felt like there was this one-to-one -one ratio between the vision in his head and what ultimately ended up on the screen. And on Star Wars, I'm, I'm early days and the one that I'm actually writing and producing, uh, but being around it, it's a, it's a process of a bunch of people that love Star Wars. So it feels like this, this sort of, we would all be writing and making fan fiction, except we get to actually make it at a higher budget level. Do you feel extra pressure there because of that? I feel pressure as a fan of it. I don't really feel pressure from the fans of it, if that makes sense. I've worked on other movies that have, like the X-Men movies, that have big fan followings. And if you start to get lost in those voices, you will be completely lost. But you also don't want to be the guy that creates the new Jar Jar Binks. No, but you, you got to trust that your own compass will lead you away from whatever mistakes were made. Scott, directing and producing, mm. uh, how do you, you know, everyone here has their own relationships with the director. How do you handle the dichotomy of responsibilities there when something you want as a director may not make sense as a producer? It really, for me, really goes hand in hand in terms of working with scheduling, budgeting, locations and then having written it also helps because uh, uh, as Simon mentioned in terms of just having your vision realized from the infancy of that very first stage all the way through release is really the only way that I know how to work. But I would say though uh, to the question about telling your, your earlier self it, it's your younger self would, would be to care less about what others think about your finished product because you as we all know making films and directing them and producing them you must grow a, a thick skin because if you're making films, as, as, as Francis Coppola would say, that everybody loves, then it's likely not very good. <laughs> Did you as a producer ever want to fire you as director? <laughs> <laughs> Probably every day. No, uh, that's a good question and, and one I can't honor uh, or, or answer you know, honestly because I, um, you're, you're so entrenched in the process of working on script and casting and making certain that you have enough money and, and then one location falls out and, and in Black Mass you're making a film about men who happen to be walking the streets of Boston whom, as Cube said, we know can be very dangerous. You know, men who have murdered countless people that you're, and you're making a film about them. All of these things that are kind of fraught with that type of peril. So uh, I don't think I had much time to consider firing myself, but there are probably others, <laughs> who, others who would. I fired myself as the writer on movies, by the way. I have actually before um, brought in uh, better writers. For whatever reason, and you're experiencing it on Revenant, there are certain movies that the press decides they're going to focus on the process of making that movie. Because most movies are really difficult to make. And most movies go over schedule and over budget. I've worked on a few that the press didn't pay attention to. And then I worked on some that the press paid a lot of attention to. The first movie I ever worked on was Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And they knew every day we went into overtime. And on Fantastic Four, it was another one of those movies that the press decided that it was a juicy story. We had the same director from start to finish. and um, But there was a parting of the ways uh, later on. And you were in the Star Wars universe when they decided not to proceed with him. Mm -hmm. So am I right to assume you had a role in those conversations? No, I, I, I was the person that brought that director into the Star Wars process and had a good experience between me and that director. That parting the ways between Josh uh, and Star Wars was a mutual, genuinely mutual parting the ways. I think he had felt 
like the pressure of making this big movie with this kind of attention. You ask about the attention and the pressure of making these larger films with a big title and a big following. He felt like he had done that and didn't love doing it and didn't want to go straight from that into doing an even bigger version of it. So, but it, you know, every movie has its complexities and its challenges and its compromises and some are stories and some are not. On that film, it was interesting that the director, before the release of the movie, came out and said that his version, or he had a version that was better. Mm -hmm. Has, have the others on the panel ever been in a situation where the director has turned on the movie? No. <clears throat> no, I've never been in that situation. <laughs> have you fired a director? No. But we're very, I mean, we're very director-driven killers. Mm -hmm. It's very director-driven, so, and we work with a lot of writer-directors, although not exclusively, and Todd Haynes did not write Carol, but it's, I think, one of, I think it's the only movie he's directed that he hasn't written himself. Mm. So I think because of that, the director is such an intrinsic part for us of the actual, you know, of, of, of the movie, that they're kind of inseparable. How did you and he become involved with that film? Well, first of all, I read the book probably 25 years ago, when it was called The Price of Salt. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, you know, it's a Patricia Highsmith novel, but it's not typical of her. She tends to write thrillers that are kind of mean-spirited in a fantastic way. <laughs> um, people had been trying to make it into a movie for years, and it came across my desk at least three times over the past 20 years. It might have come across yours, too. No. Never? No. Uh -huh. um, a producer named Elizabeth Carlson got a hold of the rights got Phyllis Nage to write a pretty extraordinary screenplay. And then we were literally on the phone together, just like complaining to each other, as producers do. Mm -hmm. And she was complaining because she had just lost her director on Carol. And I was complaining because it looked like the new Todd Haynes film wasn't gonna go <laughs> the way I thought it was gonna, because this actor was whatever, you know, et cetera. So we were really sort of mutually uh, grousing to each other. And then suddenly there was a silence and you know, somewhere over the Atlantic, you know, a light bulb went off, and we sort of said simultaneously, "Let's show it to Todd." And literally, 48 hours later, he was attached. Mm. Was it a difficult film to get off the ground? Well, a lot of the groundwork had been done by Liz because she had attached Kate Blanchett mm. very early on and had put together the financing with Film Four, the PFI, Hanway. So it was very difficult to make, though. It was a very ambitious film. Um, you know, I mean, I'm just going to reiterate everything everybody has already said. It was a film whose eyes were very much bigger than its stomach. And Todd is also, you know, very exacting in the best possible way. So it was, it was tough. It was tough to pull off. Mm. Was there any moment where you really disagreed? With Todd? You know, I think that the way we work is I'm so clear on the vision at the beginning that, that it's not that we don't really, there's no real room for us to disagree about anything substantial. I may say, you really need 100 extras? You know, I think we could, you know, I mean, that kind of thing. But once the vision is clear to me, then it's about supporting that vision. What do you do on Sundays? Oh, nothing in particular, what do you do? Oh, nothing lately. Maybe you'd like to come visit me sometime. You're welcome to. At least there's some pretty country around where I live. Would you like to come visit me this Sunday? Yes. <laughs> Stacey, how do you work with a superstar director like Quentin Tarantino? You have a three hour plus version that, that is the roadshow version. With a and 12 a minute with a, intermission right. and a four minute yeah. overture, yes. Um, <laughs> it's and a shorter version. What are the conversations between you, Quentin, and the Weinsteins ab about opening that film, releasing it? Quentin, you know, everybody knows he was working on this script. It was a different kind of movie. The script was leaked, he did a public reading of mm -hmm. the script. The film that we've shot is substantially rewritten, and the reason he was so upset about people leaking his script was because it was truly a work in progress mm. that he had only given to a very small number of us as he was playing with it. The thing about Quentin Tarantino is he's the only filmmaker that I've ever worked with who at the same time can simultaneously be both an auteur and an audience member. He's always calibrating because he wants the audience to have a good time, and he wants his films to be entertaining. We knew we were shooting in 70 millimeter. 
we knew that we were going to release in a roadshow style, which is a classic throwback sort of romance of cinema. And our particular version, um, which is uh, Ultra Panavision 70, which hasn't been used since 1967, I think, on Khartoum, and it only existed from 1955 to 1967. It was particularly challenging technically because we used lenses that hadn't been used since Ben-Hur or other films that were made in this short period of time. And not to go on about the technical aspects of it, but Panavision re-engineered their mags to hold 2,000-foot loads. And it became a real legacy project for Panavision with these amazing lenses that shot in, you know, we it's 276, which is the widest format you can project in. Get in, boys! This here is Daisy Domergue. She's wanted dead or alive for murder. When that sun comes out, I'm taking this woman to hang. Is there anybody here committed to stopping me from doing that? Well, well, well. Looks like Minnie's haberdashery is about to get cozy for the next few days. Yes, it does. What's been your toughest challenge, period, on any film? It's the production of The Revenant. The, just the physical production. The weather was very, very uncooperative. I guess there is global warming yeah. now, <laughs> I'm convinced. <laughs> and um, it was just very, very difficult. It was a very ambitious film. I think we didn't know exactly what we were biting off when we started. And it, it's been a grueling process, but it's also been very satisfying. We certainly learned a lot about ourselves. and. You know, we, we had a very, very strong team. The crew was phenomenal. All my producing partners were phenomenal. And, you know, and Alejandro's just a force of nature. So you just, you have to keep up with him. And that, without question, was the most difficult thing that I've done in my career. Snow is hard. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> Snow is really hard. We, Snow in the mountains. Yeah. Snow at altitude. Exactly. Snow in the mountains. We had, we, we, had, had, we had the same problem. We had, we had similar issues. Um, we had three call sheets prepared every single day. Yeah. We had, if it was sunny, we went inside and shot inside the haberdashery. If it was cloudy and overcast, we went into the stagecoach and shot on the stagecoach. And if it was snowing, we were out wherever we had to be to get our exterior snow shots. I think the hardest thing for me has been to, you know, get different studios to promote, you know, push the movie, market the movie, you know, as wide as they can go, you know, especially overseas. There's a lot of challenges to get the movies that I make overseas and, and get a market going. And, you know, we're starting to scratch the surface really on that. I was so proud of the fact, every day I had to hear, you're making a black Western when we were making Django, you're making yeah. a black Western. And then when we made, you know, half a billion dollars internationally on that movie, it was so great because yeah. it was like, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, so they'll say, you know, a black movie doesn't... Uh, travel. Yeah, and it's like, well, are y'all promoting? Yeah. Well, no. Well, <laughs> that's probably why it doesn't travel. Right? Yeah. You know, Self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes, yeah, you have exactly. to. How do you, you have guys to push put the, the studio to do what you want? How do you make them go that extra step? I think it starts with working with somebody, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to work with Donna Langley, you know, and she believes, you know, that's really what it takes, somebody that believes in the project, that believes what's going on. So it's the call you pick up the phone, you call and scream at her and say, Donna, Donna, they're not doing enough? Well, I don't scream at Donna. <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we just, uh, you know, put our heads together and push and push and push the, the envelope as far as we can and push the studio and push everybody's I guess plateau for the movie. We'd say, yo, it's, it's higher than that. You know, don't, don't, uh, don't put the movie in a, in a pigeonhole, you know, let's, let's go for it. You know, we've been, knock on wood, very lucky in our last few releases to, to start cracking these markets. Christine, your toughest moment? My toughest moment? I mean, I'm thinking a little bit, it's a, uh, film production's a little bit like childbirth. When it's over, you forget about it, because <laughs> otherwise you'd, you'd never do it again, <laughs> you know? I think the toughest, I can talk a little bit more generally, it's very tough right now. Um, you know, there's uh, extreme downward pressure on our budgets. Mm. We joke, you know, that now we're making the movies we used to make for 15, for five, uh, that we used to make for five, for three, you know, so, uh, you know, three's the new five, five's the new <laughs> ten. And that's really tough because it's starting to have an effect on the kind of stories we can tell. Toughest for us, I think, is we make a lot of female-driven uh, films. 
convincing financiers, studios, et cetera, that there's an audience for those movies when there obviously is, mm -hmm. is difficult. And the casting pressures that it puts on us, you know, as we said, it's called Still Alice, not Still Alice and John. Uh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Why so. financiers are often asking you to cast people that, or to consider people that you wouldn't ordinarily consider? Everyone. All the time, <laughs> all the time. Uh. And then there's also, you know, if you are making a female-driven uh. film, there's a tremendous amount of pressure to cast uh, someone of equal stature, equal, you know, financial stature with your female star. What was your pitch to Johnny Depp for Black Mass? Well, interestingly, I got a phone call after uh, Crazy Heart that Johnny appreciated the film. And his agent said to me, you know, Johnny doesn't see uh, many movies. He happened to catch that one. And he's a musician, so he, he appreciated uh, Jeff Bridges' performance and, and, and ultimately the film. So I met with Johnny. Um, I think I showed up around noon and I left at 8 p.m. And we just talked about sharing sensibility in literature and in music and in film. We both really wanted to work together. He reached out to me after my second film, Out of the Furnace, and said, I really want to make a searing drama. And I hear that you're shaping and considering Black Mass. And I said, I am. And, and he said, well, let's discuss this because I have been rumored to have been a part of this film, but come to find out he wasn't attached to it. But I said to Johnny, I said, you know, Johnny, you, you typically play very likable characters in all of your films, and we empathize with them. And I've never really seen the kind of danger in your work that I want to see in Whitey Bulger. And uh, after many conversations and discussions about um, our pasts and how we might be able to really effectively approach this part in a way that, um, because I like casting actors in ways you've never seen them before. And in, that was the challenge here. I have it on very good authority that Gennaro Angelo is planning to have you murdered. Is that so? And how does he plan to achieve that? That's the kind of information that my side gets. And that's the kind of information that we can provide. John, do you know what I do to rats? It ain't ratting, Jimmy. It's an alliance. An alliance between me and the FBI. No, no, between you and me. We agreed that we were making the same film, and uh, he was he was, could not have been more ready to go and, and to make this film because he knew that I was going to make it as, a, as I have in my last couple of films in a very unflinching manner. And I said to Johnny, I said, you know, most gangster pictures truly uh, romanticize and glorify these gangsters and I want to do just the opposite. In fact, we aren't making a gangster picture because I, with great trepidation, make this film because many of my favorite films and many of the best American films ever made live in this genre. Coppola's work, of course, and Scorsese, and, and Lumet, and, and, and Jean-Pierre Melville, filmmakers whom I've long, long admired. And I said, you know, that's a, that's a big trap, and that's a bar that we can never approximate. But what, instead of making a film about criminals who just happen to be humans, we're making a film about humans who happen to be criminals. And that is not going to likely reach the audience that most of your films reach. That line, it may not reach the audience, uh, was the studio aware that you were telling me? <laughs> <laughs> well, sure, because they are aware of my first two films that they, they tend to be, um, can be challenging for the viewer. Um, hopefully they, they stay with audiences well after they leave the theater. Nothing worse than making a film that you see on Friday night and audiences have forgotten it by the time their head has hit the pillow that night. I don't want to make those kind of films because I only have so many films in me, quite frankly. And uh, if we're going to make it, we're going to make it uh, in a way that um, hopefully will we'll leave an everlasting impression. And those, ten those types of movies typically don't reach uh, uh, as wide as an audience as others do. So I wonder about the conversations with Warner Brothers. And all these things are not the kind of things that a studio executive wants to hear. Well, no, you don't have those discussions with a studio executive. Yeah. Uh, certainly, I can, I can assure you. But I will say that uh, though I've only made three films, it was um, by far the best experience of having a studio support you in every aspect and having the head of the studio and Greg Silverman say to you, Scott, please don't forget to take risks. I said, whoa, Greg, <laughs> you're telling me that? <laughs> Just, I want to make certain at the end of this that, that we have this conversation because you know that I'm going to do that. All the way through production and through the testing process, which is my least favorite mm. experience of, uh, I don't know about you guys, do you like testing your films? 
because I don't I love do. it as the film director. I love you do. Them. I like yeah. screening them. Yeah. I mean, so I like screening part them, of it, but sure. just to put it in front of an audience and see what the reaction is, I think is so important. And, you know, I think some of the research, you can kind of throw out the window, but you get a real sense of it when you screen the movie. What did you change in straight uh, of the content following the testing? It's just pace. You know, it's like with a movie like that, you have to really, you know, worry about pacing and, and when do you take your moments and, you know, make a meal out of it, so to speak, and when do you, you know, kind of get to the next issue at hand, uh, so to speak. So it was just having that perfect balance, and I knew that would be the hardest part of editing the movie because we were trying to do a lot of different things, you know, tell a period piece, you know, be, you know, entertaining to the NWA audience, but also make a real movie that if you knew nothing about NWA, you knew nothing about rap, you would love a story about five guys who were friends and came together to try to do something cool and great. We knew that everybody could respond to that. And uh, so we were, you know. That was like a three hour 30 version, then it came down. Yes. Uh, why did you cut out? Did the studio want it? to be the, I, I could have watched that movie for another hour, <laughs> yeah. to, you know, I loved it. Don't tell what? Gary Gray. <laughs> but so, uh, who pressured you to bring it down and will there be a longer version? Well, you know, to me, you know, it was too long at 3.30, you know, things needed to be tightened up and uh, we were living in spaces way too long and, you know, it, um, it just wasn't an enjoyable ride for me as a film fan. Uh, so we just wanted to make sure that it it uh, it played well, you know. Last thing you want to do with a good movie is hold the audience hostage, you know, with with a with a good movie. You want to make sure you tell what you got to tell, get to it, make sure it's a great experience, and and you know, time to move on. As an entertainer myself, you know, I just know it's better when you're when you leave and wanting more mm -hmm. than than mm -hmm. to you know, stick around too long. I always told people, you know, you don't want to see a four hour version of Straight Outta Compton, but you don't want to see a 90 minute version of it either. Right. So you have to find that perfect, you know, perfect balance. Simon and Steve, you've both worked at Fox recently. Mm. How does that experience compare with other studios and how is each studio different? I've worked with Fox a lot. I mean, I've made uh, the majority of movies I've worked on have been at Fox. I, I like it there, I find them really straight and you know what you're going to get and hardworking and challenging. When you have a long-term relationship with a studio, part of how that helps is it's not just about that movie. They know that there are more movies going forward, there are movies behind you, and so one, you get the fluency of knowing their rhythms, and two, there's an investment that's beyond that movie. Regardless of the, the, the scale and the expectations of that film, you know that it's a long-term commitment. I've found them Especially, I, I work closely with Emma Watts, who's the president of production there, and she said something similar to us on The Martian that you heard from Greg Silverman, which is she said, make it different. And that's not something that you expect to hear from a studio when you're spending $100 million on a film, um, but she did. And that movie, as a process, was a very positive process in that we had a book that, that I found and people loved, uh, the first draft of the script written by Drew Goddard. Um, everybody responded positively to, and they actually greenlit the first draft of that with Drew directing it. Drew was initially gonna direct the film before Ridley. I sent the script to Matt Damon, uh, like on a Friday. I had worked with him on a movie called Elysium. Mm. Going back, by the way, to our worst experiences, Matt and I on Elysium were in a landfill dump uh, outside Mexico City for three weeks, <laughs> shooting in the second biggest landfill dump in the world. Everybody on the crew was wearing hazmat suits and gas masks, except the actors. Oh, wow. Because mm. they were on camera. So mm. Matt showed up because we were like, it's fine. We've checked the soil. <laughs> sure. It's completely safe. He shows up, you know, excited to go to work. And everyone around him is wearing a hazmat suit. Um, did he get sick? He did not get sick, uh, thankfully. But then when I uh, sent him The Martian, I was like, no, no dumps in the movie. It's, <laughs> it's Mars and a, and, a, and a space station. Fast forward to assuming we were gonna shoot Mars in a soundstage, you know, with green screen, the way you do if you're creating another universe most of the time these days. But for Ridley, it was really important to create as immersive and realistic an environment as possible. So we shot all of Mars in Jordan in the desert, which was a different challenge than the, than the, the snow, but was a challenge. And Matt's walking around the deserts of Jordan in a spacesuit, 
um, which, you know, is not dangerous, but is not comfortable. Did uh, he have the little coolers like the Iron Man suit? Yeah, the, in, <laughs> the, the inside coolers, he did. Um, but, you know, you're schlepping out to the middle of the desert every day. He's the greatest guy in the he's entire world. He's amazing. Yeah, I made Contagion amazing. with him, and he's just, he just brings the greatest attitude yeah. to the set every single day. Yeah. Is there anyone you wouldn't work with again? You think I would tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully no one around this table. <laughs> Actually, I have to say, there. I have not had a lot of bad... I, I honestly, people talk about, oh, these horrible experiences. I really haven't had a... a I can't really think of anybody that I've had a bad experience with. No, I mean, there are people that you're more inclined to want to work with. And, you know, it's really about talent. Some of the people are difficult, but, you know, it's a balancing act. Is the person worth the extra effort? And there are people that I'm not in a rush to work with, but there's, there's a lot of great people that I can't wait to work with again, but they'll all remain nameless. That's the happiest, though. Like, the, Matt is a great example. Yeah. Um, Ridley, for me, was a similar example of someone who is a good person person and a good artist. Mm. And it, right. it, 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 there's a line actually in a movie that's not represented here in Jobs um, where Wozniak says to Steve Jobs, it's not binary. Being a good person and being a good artist are not mutually exclusive. And it doesn't mean that many artists over history and over the history of filmmaking are difficult people and often those things, often those things are connected, but they're not automatically. Mm. I think I've been really spoiled because the two filmmakers that I've worked with the most, um, Quentin and Steven Soderbergh, are such good people. Mm. And they care so much about their work and they care about it being a good work environment that everybody always says they're the best environments for them to work with. So I don't know. I, Steven Soderbergh always says, you know, repeat business and treat people well. And that's how we ended up with him on Out of Sight because... Casey Silver loved working with him so much that he actually recommended mm. him to us. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mind if a you know, director is difficult or any of that. Long as he cares about the project. Long as he's difficult to make the project right. better and he's just not on some... But is there a line yeah. of behavior you won't tolerate? I mean, some of those great Hollywood filmmakers, directors and producers were abusive people. I was just reading Michael Caine's autobiography. He talks about working with Otto Preminger, who would explode at people. Is there a point where you where you step in and say you can't behave like this? I don't think people behave like that anymore. Do you? <laughs> no, I haven't seen it, but you know, I would step in if somebody was being too, you know, uh, abusive to crew, or you know, or you know, somebody who just didn't have the spirit of the movie in their heart, you know, and they get to the set, and if they're a little too disruptive, I don't mind pulling them to, to the side and saying, look, we're all here for the same reason. We're all here to make a great movie, you know, so. But I don't mind it, because I know, you know, a lot of artists have their quirky ways, and that's cool, you know, as long as you make a good movie and we get it in the can. Is the music business tougher? Um, no. Crazier, yeah. Not tougher. No, it's nothing tougher than making a movie. You know, making a record is, you know, you can kind of come and go as you please. You know, making a movie, you're there. <laughs> you better be. Christine, you stayed away from the studio system by and large. Why? Um, you know, I I guess just the the kinds of movies that Killer makes, you know, tend to be movies that are better served by independent financing. In other words, they're very execution dependent, meaning that they're not worth anything unless they're good. And it's often very hard to get a studio involved early on on something that tends to be that original. Um, they often will acquire them afterwards once we've proved that what we saw in it, in fact, did exist. But, um, but I think that's why, and that kind of independent film, that kind of independent financing gives us the, um, the freedom to make the movie very much the way we want to. I mean, it comes with its drawbacks, too. There's often just not enough of it, and it's hard to expand, you know. It's hard to go over budget. Since we work with a lot of filmmakers who have, you know, extremely original visions, which is what makes their work interesting, um, it's, you know, it's, it has served us in the best way. I have a question about Tarantino. Um, as someone who's worked with him for a long time, how do you respond when he gets criticized, as he often is, especially for the, on the race issues? Um, you know, that's come up in several of his movies. Here's the thing. Um, Quentin is not a calculating person. Quentin is a filmmaker who 
really dives into things very seriously and deeply. And so when he does interviews, he really wears his heart on his sleeve. He doesn't hold anything back. He doesn't think about how things are going to be packaged into sound bites or this kind of clickbait world that we live in where people put, pull headlines out of little things out of context. So I think it's it's unfair and I hope that he never becomes a person who's like too guarded to really talk about how he feels about cinema or the filmmakers that have influenced him or, or to take risks and I don't think he will but I hope that he doesn't retreat to not have conversations. Um, he cares very much about issues of race. He's interested in exploring where we're at, you know, and he doesn't hold back. And he figures that the party will move on to the next kind of headline at a certain point. He's prepared to talk about it and he's prepared to not censor himself. And if that means that there are things that happen in social media. He's sort of, you know, it's it's like damn the torpedoes. He's not going to stop following who he is as a filmmaker or what his voice is as a writer because, you know, a blog goes after him. On Django, I don't think any of us were prepared for what we went through because nobody really wanted to look at slavery in that big way before, and it kind of paved the way for films like 12 Years a Slave to have the audience that they had. He sort of, he, he takes the bullets and goes out on the front line on the things that he cares about and he's not worried about doing it. And it's why I really admire and respect him. Do you, you agree with that? Yeah, you know, I think when it comes to art and the artists, you know, you should do what you feel and let the audience feel what they feel. But there has been criticism about Django, about some things Quetta said, you know, within the social media universe especially from the African-American community. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that criticism? Um, you know, it depends, you know. Um, see, they seated know. us next to each other. <laughs> 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 this whole thing. No, but, but uh, they're hoping had, yeah. I'll start talking no, no, no. about women Django and straight a, out of Compton <laughs> too, yeah, right? Django had more than 100 <laughs> references to the N-word in it. Yeah, but that, you know, that's fine. You know, that, that to me doesn't make the movie, uh, you know, that much more inflammatory than the next. You know, to me, it was a, a great Western, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to me, um, in a lot of ways. And um, I didn't mind the movie. And I, I usually don't mind movies that people think go overboard because I think that's what art is all about. You know, art is about pushing us and making us examine ourselves. And hopefully you learn something about yourself by looking at a movie like that. And, and I think that's ultimately what it's all about. What film have you seen, all of you recently, that has taught you something about yourself or made the biggest mark on you? I mean, you know, I know it's the movie I just did, but uh, Straight Outta Compton taught me a lot about the era that I lived through. When you're living through it and you're going, you know, a thousand miles an hour and you take a minute to turn around and look back and you're able to kind of put that into a comprehensive film you know, you know, I learned what, you know, we mean to a lot of people. This is a slice of American history, no matter how you look at it or what angle you try to look at it from. This is a, a slice of who we are. And, um, you know, it, it did teach me a lot about what I've done in my past and, you know, what I can do in my future. Mm, indeed, I would say my first two films, which were really personal stories for me as I was writing them, uh, you learn a lot about yourself as you're dredging up familial experiences or past experiences, people that you've dealt with in your life, and you're writing it, and then you're shooting it, and you're having other actors interpret that, and then you're cutting it, and then you're releasing it into the world, and those movies, back to your point about having thicker skin, when you make really personal films like that, and then you put them out for people who are film writers who uh, don't have to take the same kind of courage. Do you read all the criticism? Oh, no, I don't. Robert Duvall said to me, he said, Scott, don't uh, read reviews. Uh, he produced Crazy Heart. Uh, but you hear, because my wife does read them. Uh, or other people <laughs> read them and say, wow, you I can't believe he didn't wow, like they really that. don't like you, <laughs> oh, yeah, right, right, right. But uh, again, you, you, know, you, you can't really care when you make the kind of films that I make. Um, no. Largely what people who write about films. Christine, was there a film that's really changed your life? Not, um, maybe not that you worked on. Is there another film that you saw that shifted the direction of your life? 
Well, uh, you know, we make a lot of first-time filmmakers' movies. Boys Don't Cry, for example. This year, we executive produced a film called White Girl uh, by a first-time director named Elizabeth Wood. And I feel like I have to keep doing them because often first-time filmmakers are telling a story that they've waited their whole life to tell, mm -hmm. and it reminds me to not be cynical and um, because that's a hard thing, I think, as a producer. It's very hard to avoid cynicism because hmm. life can be so Indeed. hard. Do you agree with that, Steve? So yeah, yeah, for Are sure. Are you cynical? Yeah, I mean, not to interrupt, but I, 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 you do become cynical because as the producer, all of the problems land at you. So all day long, you're the person that's dealing with everybody's issues and problems, um, which is a, you know, a tough thing to go into every workday knowing you're the person that's going to be the first sort of, um, not even line of defense, you're often the last line of defense as well. Uh, but you're going to absorb all of those issues and problems and hopefully solve them over the span of a given day. I mean, thing for me that was a challenge on Martian that's related to this is that it's a very optimistic movie. Mm -hmm. And I actually think I also am not a naturally optimistic person, maybe as a Jew, maybe as a writer, all of the things that are stacked against me being optimistic are <laughs> genetically stacked against me. And when I read the book of The Martian and the script, it is so unabashedly optimistic, intelligently optimistic. And those are two things I hadn't really seen before. Usually intelligence comes with a certain amount of cynicism or edge or criticism. Um, and it has for me in the past and it has personally. And I read the book and felt like there's a, there's a passage at the end of the book. It's about how the human spirit is fundamentally good and that when people are trapped in a mine or an earthquake hits a city, people from all around the world send supplies. And that that is, no matter what your race, religion, nationality, that is your basic instinct. Um, and that was something when I read it in the book that seemed true, but I would not have believed it to be true before reading the book. <laughs> and I felt when we were making the movie that there was a chance it would, we would lose that optimism. That in a science fiction movie, and directed by Ridley, who's made darker films mm -hmm. in the past, that we would lose that spirit. And it was something that um, everybody just worked hard to hold on to. Let's do the math. Our service mission here was supposed to last 31 souls. For redundancy, they sent 68 souls worth of food. That's for six people. So for just me, that's going to last 300 souls, which I figure I can stretch to 400 if I ration. So I got to figure out a way to grow three years worth of food here on a planet where nothing grows. Luckily, I'm a botanist. Ridley saw the film as an opportunity to explore a different part of his psyche mm -hmm. too. And I think the movie was very cathartic and even almost curative for him because he also has this really warm, kind, generous soul that he hasn't fully expressed mm. in his work before, yeah, yeah. you know? That the movie became kind of I that wonder if it was a sort of catharsis after his brother's death and everything too. I, I know that, you know, the last few years were, 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 were hard for him and um, I know he laughed a lot while we were making the movie. Mm. And that was something that the crew around him... That's nice to hear because he produced my film, mm. Out of the Furnace, in which Christian Bale loses his brother as his brother mm. was... Oh, was, wow. Uh, yeah, so that um, is always difficult when you're... You're making those kind of films. Steve, so are you nice more cynical see. than you were when you started? No. I think that I'm in a unique situation because I'm part of a company, Anonymous Content, and we have, I have so many colleagues. And I think that for me, what's, you know, being a producer can be a very lonely job. It really is. And it, it's a very, very tough job. And I tell people to just be a pure producer. If you can do that, I really admire you. And it's better if you have a trust fund. <laughs> um, it's, it's just, it's and your really, last name is Ellison. It helps. <laughs> no names. Uh, but it, it is a hard slog. But I think what keeps me more optimistic is the fact that I have all these colleagues that are much younger and much more um, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and haven't developed a thick skin yet. That's what I think keeps me young and relevant and, and optimistic because I think, like Simon, we have a similar background and there's a cynicism to that, especially from my generation. And I think that my colleagues really make a big difference in in me being more positive. I've learned a lot from them. This year, I mean, Hollywood can be a very secretive place, and this year with the Sony hack, we saw a lot of the behind the scenes things in the industry come out in the open. What's something that you learned from the information that was released in that hack? I think I learned, 
you know, don't, there's a lot of things you just shouldn't email. Right. You know? mm-hmm. My phone started ringing a lot more afterwards. Like people, no, are, yeah, ca- right. people are calling each other. Or you receive more. much shorter replies. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Or let's go offline and discuss exactly. this. Exactly. Interesting. Is there anything about the industry, any of the behind the scenes stuff that you guys learned? I didn't read them. Yeah, I did don't, I, I thought it was really wrong that they were released, the personal emails, and I wouldn't want somebody digging through anybody else's trash, and I think it was unfair. I would 100% agree with that. You, and did, I actually you didn't think read them either? No, I didn't read them. I, in the same way that if someone handed me your phone right now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take advantage read to cats. read your emails. And I actually think it's unfair generally and then specifically to Amy. I think I, we I all, agree. a lot of us have worked with Amy and she is Amy actually Pascal. a good person, Amy Pascal. She's a really good person. Yes. Who was the head of Sony Pictures and essentially was forced to resign because of all this. Mm. Did any of you talk to her about that? I mean, I think everybody probably felt terrible and probably said as much when they saw her. You know, yeah. she's, yeah. she's, you know, I remember, um, David Fincher making a comment about how lucky he was that one of the great patron saints running a studio, you know, was a director groupie, loved directors, mm-hmm. you know. So when you lose somebody who loves filmmakers running a, a studio, that's not a great thing, you know, and somebody who has cared so consistently about filmmakers. Are there any studios now that really care about filmmakers? Because the thing any of us who've been here for a few years have seen is this corporatization of the studios. Clearly Harvey Weinstein cares about filmmakers. I mean, we're, you know, I I don't know anybody that would devote their resources to the kinds of films that Christina and I make and certainly say they're gonna be a showman to go update an outdated system and acquire roughly three projectors to every, you know, to make every one and spend a year making a hundred 70 millimeter release come true, or Donna. Yeah, I mean, I love Donna over at Universal. She's amazing. Straight shooter. And when she's behind something, uh, I just love people who keep their word, you know, when they, <laughs> well, when they get behind something, they, they push. And, and uh, you know, she's been one of the best relationships I've had. And I'll industry. say the same about Warner Brothers because Super my first two man. films she's have, were, I mean, all three were really made with independent spirit. This is the first time that I've actually worked within the studio system. And they couldn't have been more supportive in every regard. Uh, I, I had more money to make this film than I've ever made. You know, they were seeing the dailies every day. They knew that you're seeing one of the biggest stars in the world whose movies uh, typically make, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars doing things that his fan base will not uh, particularly like seeing him do. Yet they never once said to me, Scott, uh, this is too violent or... Uh, the film is too languidly paced, those sort of things. They really let me make the film that I want to make. And and, it, and I think it's, uh, I don't know if it's rare in the studio system because it's only my first time having worked with a studio, but uh, I would uh, work with them uh, in a heartbeat. I hate to pile on in terms of being positive to the studios, supporting <laughs> filmmakers, but I will. Um, I was fortunate enough this year to work on two films, Spotlight and Revenant. And um, Spotlight was financed by Participant Media and Jonathan King and Jeff Skoll honestly could not have been more supportive of Tom McCarthy. This was a very difficult movie with the, you know, the pitch line is a difficult movie to finance. And they were phenomenal. They were tough on the budget, which I think made sense. You know, it was not an insignificant amount of money. And they were really, really supportive of the process and of Tom McCarthy and Josh with the script and all through the process of making the movie. The Revenant, on the other hand, was, you know, was Arnon. It wasn't Fox. Um, New Regency made that movie. They had a couple of partners, Rat Pack and a few others. You know, Arnon and Brad are really running an operation that is very, very supportive of the filmmakers and the filmmaker first. So in both those cases, I've been very fortunate this year to have people that really respect the process of the filmmaker and that's the business that I've been in for a long time, and that's really when, the way I want to work. When this comes out, you may have a lot of studios actually reminding you of what you just said. <laughs> Is this a great era for producers? No. Why not? It's the toughest job there is, and I think that the, we're diminished, I think, frankly. How so? You, just in terms of the process, I think producers have been diminished over, over the years. We're, we're looked at sometimes as not necessarily additive. You, you have a very tough job. You're there to solve problems. You know, a lot of people at this table, they initiate their projects. And then it's, I think it's a very, very tough job. And I don't think that it's the era of the producer. I don't know how you guys feel about that. 
Well, I will admit to have, having read Christine's book twice. <laughs> and uh, as someone who, is, as he was writing Crazy Heart, and long admired what Christine does, uh, really in the trenches of making great landmark independent films, it, it really uh, gave me a sense of optimism that you really can get made what you want to get made if you really do not uh, give in, because there's so many opportunities to give in and say, you know what, I just can't make this, or I can't make it with the cast I want to make it with. Christine, is it a great era for producers? <laughs> How do I follow that? Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I really agree with, with Steve. There's financiers who consider themselves producers, so, and some are creative producers, but there are financiers who would just as soon get rid of us, you know, <laughs> yeah. see us as, uh, baggage. as yeah. baggage. It's humiliating to have to explain your value. That's right. You know? Mm. Is, there a, is there a single film that you saw as a child that you think puts you on this path? or something that you were forbidden from watching that you maybe did, something that, that you think was especially influential? Certainly for me. Uh, now that I have two young girls, I have every so often what we call inappropriate movie night, mm -hmm. that my two <laughs> young daughters can <laughs> see movies cool. that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that perhaps they shouldn't see. But for me, it was, it was certainly um, two films, Francis Coppola's um, Godfather, Godfather Two, and then as a third one, The Conversation. Or oh, Coppola. Hmm. It's a uh, two... Uh, black exploitation movies that I saw when I was too young. My <laughs> brothers and my brother and my two sisters took me to the Century Drive-In Theater, and we saw The Mac. I met The Mac. <laughs> I met Max Mac. Julian. Yes, yeah. I saw The Mac. I've we seen saw, The Mac. We saw uh, Coffee. The same. You know, it was a double oh. feature. That uh, blew fun. my mind. Coffee and, uh, is so great. I'm still trying to recover. <laughs> I just saw Coffee again recently, and it yeah. totally holds up. We screened it in Colorado. Is that right? Yeah, and it completely holds up. Yeah. She is the best. Um, I had two also. They were Clockwork Orange and Raging Bull. And I saw Clockwork Orange probably like 20 times at an inappropriate age, about, I think I was like 13 or 14, and it was on whatever the precursor to, like the Z channel or something like that, and my I was old enough to babysit for myself, but, you know, and so nobody was home. And I, I watched it every time it came on. And, you know, Kubrick and Scorsese were the, I guess it's, it doesn't really make what I end up doing surprising <laughs> when you look at those yeah. two. Kubrick was, one for, Kubrick was one for me, too. The first for me was Empire Strikes Back, um, which I saw with my dad uh, and, and said, I want to do that, having no idea what, what that was. But I didn't know it was art until I saw 2001. When I saw 2001, that was the first time where I felt like film is art and there are people that constructed that art uh, and made me want to be a filmmaker. How old were you when you saw that? When I saw 2001, I actually saw it at, my dad was a film school teacher. Oh. Uh, so I saw it, he had a, I had like a laser disc of it and he showed it in class and I used to go to his classes here in LA. Uh, so I would have been actually older, like 12, 13 years old. I grew up uh, before most of these guys, and it was an era before there was home video and before there was any kind of cable TV. So I hadn't seen a lot of important movies. I, you know, would go to the movies with my friends. And then when I went to NYU in the early 70s, that was a time where they had a phenomenal film collection, and they would show two or three important films a week, and I had never seen them, you know? So I saw Fellini, Antonioni, Robert Bresson, you know, and I was exposed to all these films at the same time that it was the 70s, so the commercial films also were a very special thing. But it was really uh, not until I went to NYU and started to see these films that I didn't grow up at a place, there was no art house movie theater near where I grew up. So I had never seen any of these films, and I saw quite a few films in a very short period of time and had a huge influence was on Was there me. any one in particular? I would say Red Desert was one of the films that really blew me away in Pickpocket. I mean, you know, there were, there were quite a few films during that period, but it was also the time, you know, when, um, you know, The Deer Hunter and a, a lot of, uh, you know, Apocalypse Now, those movies were, were out there. And obviously The Godfather was an enormous, it's cliche, but it was an enormous influence on me as well. How about you, Christine? I also grew up, I grew up in uh, <coughs> New York City and I could walk to the movie theater. And so the two movies that had a lot of influence on me were The Poseidon Adventure, <laughs> which I think I just kept going back and watching it, you know, week after week. And then me and my best friend were uh, trying to find a horror film, and we passed a theater that was showing Cries and Whispers by Bergman, and we thought, oh, 
that's a horror film, and it was, <laughs> but not the <laughs> kind. <laughs> It's hard to imagine two more different films. Yes. That's fun. good. Well, let's say thank you, everybody, for taking part in Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter producers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.